Hello, everybody, everybody, um, and thank you ever so much for coming to this. Uh, my name is David Pearson, for those who don't know me. Um, and the aim of this session is to talk about book owners online, to present, uh, to raise awareness of this database that we have been working on, um, and hopefully to get some discussion going at the end about uh, where we should go from here, how we should kind of proceed. The, the plan for this session is that um, we've got four of us uh, to do little presentations about the database from uh, different aspects. Um, I will shortly hand over to Claude Murphy, who was our research assistant over the summer, for, uh, who helped to build the database. Uh, and then David Shaw, who's been doing some volunteer editing on the database. We'll talk a little bit about it from his perspective. Um, and then Sarah Cusk from Oxford has kindly agreed uh, to come in as a kind of um, external um, external critical friend but expert in this field uh, with some observations on the database and where we've got to so far from the perspective of somebody like her. Uh, and then I will try and wrap everything up uh, and point to some questions that I'd like us to think about and talk about uh, in, in the rest of the time. Um, so what Book Owners Online is, uh, if you haven't had a chance to have a look at it already, but I hope you have, is a freely available online database uh, which aims to do what it says in its title, uh, to be a, uh, an accessible reference source about book owners, to be an online um, database on book owners. We, we went live with it last August. Uh, when it had a little bit under 1,400 entries in it, all for um, English 17th century book owners. Since then, we've been continuing to build it, and we've now got a bit over 1,700 names in, uh, and we're trying to expand it a bit geographically and also move into the 18th century. Um, but others will talk more in detail about what is actually in it. Um, and for starters, I'd like to hand over to... Cloder, who, as I say, was our research assistant in building the database and putting it together uh, over much of last year. Uh, she's recently moved uh, at least virtually, if not physically, to Leiden, uh, where she is uh, starting a PhD uh, studentship there as part of the um, European Research Council funded Feathers project. Um, but sadly, she isn't going to have the opportunity to tell you about that today. She's going to talk to you about book owners online. Cloda, over to you. Thank you. Um, okay. So, um, can everyone see this okay? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so thank you um, first to David and to the Bibsoc for inviting me uh, to speak this afternoon. Um, as David said, I was um, a research assistant on this project um, last year. Um, so I am going to just say a little bit about what is in the database and what individual entries contain. Um, and then I'm going to discuss how we uh, built it and how it works uh, and outline some of the different ways that a user might choose to uh, navigate the site. Um, so there are currently just over 1,700 owners on the site. Um, almost 90% of these are academics, clergymen uh, and professionals such as lawyers and physicians. Um, the remaining 10% includes businessmen, women, uh, tradesmen and monarchs. Um, the site is based on David's original listing of book owners, which focused on English owners who died between 1610 and 1715. Um, and as David mentioned, um, since the site launched last August, uh, both 18th century owners and Scottish owners have begun to be added as part of the initial step towards uh, expanding the site. Um, so this is the entry for George Carew. Um, each entry is structured in the same way, and the aim is to summarise uh, what is known about the owner and their books, how they can be recognised and where to find more information. Um, initially, we were going to have entries for family libraries as well, um, in which there were multiple owners, but because we have standardised owners' names as the page titles, uh, this became impractical. 
so we separated these out and linked the pages together with the property um, cross-reference, uh, which I will come back to. Um, so each entry starts with some biographical information. Um, so this is just a concise summary that outlines the details of the owner's career, their place of origin, and uh, their university education, if applicable. Um, this is then followed by information about the owner's library, uh, which aims to briefly outline such details as when and how the library was formed, um, how many and what type of books it contained, and what happened to them. Um, if surviving books are known, then a selective list of surviving examples is given, um, as can be seen here. Uh, but again, this is a concise um, and selective summary. And this is followed by a description of characteristic ownership marks if these have been identified. Um, and this is to enable the recognition and ident identification of owners from marks in books. Um, visual examples might be included um, as well. Um, and these are captioned with details of their source, such as the armorials database, um, or if possible, the book from which the image was taken um, and where the book is held. Um, if the image is a handwriting sample, then dates are also given. Um, we currently have just over 600 images of ownership marks on the site. Um, and so this includes inscriptions, book plates, um, and armorial stamps. Uh, and we're very grateful to the institutions um, that have given us image permissions. Um, and a full list of these institutions can be accessed on the main page. Um, and then finally, there is a brief list of sources um, that includes um, those that we have used to create the entry and others that are recommended to support further research. So the idea is for these entries to be starting points that can offer a brief overview of the owner and uh, directions to other resources for further research. Um, so to build Boo, we use Semantic Media Wiki, uh, and which is the software used famously for Wikipedia. Um, we opted for SMW because the format of wikis as collections of searchable pages allow a list of owners. Um, wikis are also famously collaborative and extensible, um, and we very much want Boo to continue to grow um, and to be increasingly collaboratively developed. SMW also allows us to annotate the text with semantic tags, um, which turns the directory into the database uh, and open up additional ways to navigate the information. So these annotations consist primarily of categories and properties, um, and the text on each entry is marked up with a mixture of these. Um, so categories appear as tags at the bottom of each page. The computer generates these as separate lists that serve as finding or browsing aids. Um, there are currently 69 categories uh, in use on the site, and uh, these are mostly related to the owner's occupation, um, their ownership marks if they have any, and how their books were dispersed if this is known. Properties are embedded in the text, um, and they, they enable the computer to make links between data and between pages, um, which then improves the user's ability to carry out um, more advanced searches. Um, and we currently have 37 properties in use on the database. And um, when we built the schema, we had to balance historical nuance with the consistency that's desired by the software. Um, and this threw up some sticky questions. Um, how do you decide, for example, the amount of soldiering that makes it appropriate to tag someone in the category military? And how can you guarantee that the schema you decide upon will be applicable to each individual entry? when there is so much variation in personal biography. And so at first we tried to accommodate as much detail as possible, um, but this meant that the schema grew too convoluted and the site just became more difficult to navigate. Um, so we made the markup more high level. Um, this does mean that a degree of specificity was slightly lost. Um, the property values for subject, for example, are standardized so that patristics um, devotional and doctrinal works are all tagged as subject theology. Um, but this does mean that the schema is applicable to all entries and um, the search functions are more accurate as a result. 
Um, like the categories, the computer generates automatic properties lists, which can serve as finding or browsing aids. Um, but the properties are a bit more versatile than the categories. Um, users can view the properties given to each specific entry by selecting the Browse Properties tool uh, in the navigation button. So these are Carew's properties. Um, you can see, for example, that his bequest to Sir Thomas Stafford um, is marked up with the properties bequest and beneficiary. Um, the cross-reference property here uh, creates internal links between pages. Um, so Carew's page links uh, to William Lord's, for example. Um, and this is a feature very common to wikis, uh, but it's particularly useful here for tracing the dispersal of libraries and connections between owners. Um, if you select the tiny magnifying glass um, next to William Lord in the cross-reference property, um, this also allows you to see the properties given to William Lord um, and the pages in which he crops up, uh, of which there are 30. So you can map owners through these properties. Um, the properties and categories also allow for more detailed searches, such as semantic searches. Um, so if you wanted to know how many clergymen uh, sold their books at auction and you wanted to know the subjects of these books and the languages they were in, um, you could use the semantic search uh, as such and it would generate um, a table with these results. Um, so some other options for searching and browsing include carrying out a simple keyword search, um, which is the most direct way of searching in the database, but isn't always the most accurate uh, when it comes to the more detailed search requests. Um, alternatively, the all owners category can be accessed in the navigation tool and this functions as an A to Z index of everyone on the site um, and is probably the most straightforward way to browse. Um, images of ownership marks will come up in a keyword search as well because of how they are uh, captioned, but these are also browsable um, as the list of um, media files. Um, so they function as another option for browsing the database. Um, so that's all that I have time for today, but um, thank you all for listening. I'm very happy to answer any questions uh, or expand on anything in the discussion. Um, and I think I'm now going to hand over to uh, David Shaw. Good. I... There we are. I hadn't done my video button. It's all clicking buttons, isn't it? Um, my association with the project goes back really quite a long way. Uh, the, it, the the project was preceded by uh, a PDF file which the society has hosted on its website, um, which David Pearson created. And uh, um, I was contributing to that from its very very early days, and as a member of the society's council, strongly supported the giving of a grant to set up the database that we're discussing this evening. So I had prior experience of both media wiki editing and creating a semantic media wiki database. So um, I guess I was a prime candidate for trying to help with uh, getting this project on further. Most of my initial help uh, in the days of David Pearson's PDF file of 17th century book owners was to add uh, Canterbury connections. Now, I'll show you some of those. Uh, this is because I uh, research in Canterbury in the Cathedral Library and Archives and of course uh, 17th century canons and prebendaries are prime candidates for owners of libraries and so uh, many of them of course were obvious names to go in but of course 
those of us who poke around in archives inevitably find additional candidates that aren't necessarily always obvious. And I think as we come to expand the database, there'll be quite a lot of local information of that sort. We, will sh we shall need to try to get uh, volunteers to submit for adding to it. So I will now share my screen and show you some entries on the database. Uh, that's the page. Okay, um, one of, or rather two of our canons at uh, Canterbury Cathedral in the 17th century were the father and son uh, Isaac Casaubon and uh, Méric Casaubon. So if we do a simple search for Casaubon, the um, we're, we're searching, you can, as you see, you can search all sorts of things, but uh, typically you're searching the main entries. And so it recognizes it has main heading for Isaac Casaubon and for uh, his son Méric, which we can click on, and uh, finds their names in text matches within the entries too. Um, it then finds William Sumner, the great Canterbury 17th century antiquary, uh, because uh, he and Mary Casaubon were great friends and uh, gave books to each other. And then there's another Casaubon reference, uh, Charles II and James VI and I. Uh, James, of course, was responsible for giving Isaac Casaubon his prebend at uh, Canterbury. And Sir Henry Wotton, a local and national magnate, but a, a Kentish man, uh, lodged with Casaubon. And so searching the database like this will turn up more than uh, simple uh, references to main entries. But if we go, for example, click on Marie Casaubon, provided my internet connection is working, you can see the structure which Cloda has just uh, highlighted for us uh, with forename, family name, and dates where we have them, and a biographical description, a reasonably extensive one here, and a description of his books, uh, where, they, where they came from, where they survive, um, connection then to William Sumner, uh, who inherited some of Casaubon's books, and links to sources as well, and the categories as uh, clergy and canon of Canterbury, and of course he was an owner. If we click on William Sumner, we get more biography and lots of cross-references to other library owners. Uh, Sumner, as one of the leading antiquaries of the mid-century, knew all the important people, especially those working on uh, Anglo-Saxon at this period. We've got information about uh, catalogues of his books, uh, the books that he and his brother gave to Canterbury Cathedral, and the ones that the cathedral purchased from his widow after his death, and then more uh, references. Uh, particularly, we give references to uh, the Oxford uh, Dictionary of National Biography and uh, to uh, the parliamentary biographies as well. But um, we, uh, we're trying, just like all proper wikis do, to document our sources. So I've got um, another uh, set to show you, uh, because this set of entries raise questions and problems. One of the problems, as you can see, is what is the form of the surname? Some reference works call 
the family of the Marquis of Lothian Kerr with one R, and some sources call him Kerr with two R's. And so uh, we have the facility to enter both forms, record them uh, with the property of name, uh, and uh, re the system will retrieve these people under whatever name you use. And of course, we, we're trying to record uh, personal titles where they occur, because that might be um, a search term that people will try finding the Marcus of Lothian rather than William Kerr. And we've got biography there, and we've got here more family members, so that these are all cross-referenced as family, and you can click on each one, navigate through the database, um, and find that not all entries have any extensive biography. Um, the second son of the first Marquis was appointed director of Chancery in Scotland, um, and that's about all I found to say about him when I made this entry a couple of weeks ago which is not to say that someone in Scotland might not be able to find more about him and submit information that we can add here. I've been working from a list of Scottish armorial book plates, which for, from the Franks collection at uh, the, the British Museum. So we record the Franks entry where we can, and also, as I said earlier, giving links to other of the, the brothers in this family who also are recorded by Franks as having book plates. Um, so the, the cross references are obviously of value for people exploring these uh, names here. So uh, people can easily find more you can click on a category and a list of judges, fellow judges, as well as Kerr himself, uh, and each one can be clicked. And so there's every amount of opportunity to explore the database uh, in exactly the way that you expect a wiki to do. So I will uh, stop my screen share there. I shall remain around to join in the discussion. And I now hand over to uh, Sarah Cusk for the next contribution. Right, um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes, and hear me as well, yes? Yes. And I've set my timer, so I feel I'm all ready to go. Um, so, um, uh, yes, my name is Sarah Cusk, and I am uh, the antiquarian cataloguer at two Oxford colleges, Lincoln College and Wadham. Um, and David asked me to come here and talk as a critical friend about the database. Um, and I was enormously flattered and then almost instantly felt a kind of panic and thought maybe that was a poison chalice and I could it could only go horribly wrong, but I'm going to... Uh, set about doing it. I've got this picture of a shelf, in, an attractive shelf um, in Lincoln College Library, just while I talk about myself and introduce myself to keep people um, engaged. So um, I spend a lot of time as the cataloger thinking about 17th century book owners, um, because both Wadham and Lincoln, both libraries really increased enormously in size because of bequests and donations made in the 17th century. So um, I think this database is a fantastic resource um, and I'm very excited about it. I think my interest, um, having listened to Cloda and David Shaw talk about the huge amount of information that's available, I feel that my what I'm looking for is perhaps rather limited because I come to the database with a book in hand and often a, title, a name on a title page or something scribbled somewhere and that's my starting point. So I'm possibly more interested in individual owners than in 
ownership, the larger questions that you can answer by using the database. So I'm conscious as I'm saying this, that it's a bit limited, um, that I'm not, I haven't yet done the kinds of searches about the types of people who owned books. Um, so what I thought I'd do is just think about the questions on the, on the, the landing page of the website. Um, there are questions about what exactly um, this database can help us do. So did this person own books? How many and what kind? What happened to those books? And where do I look for more information about this book owner? So I think those are they're the right questions. Um, and they're the kinds of questions that I definitely have. So what I'm going to do is just think about a couple of examples, look at a couple of examples where when I went to work on Sunday, the database was incredibly helpful. Um, a couple of examples where it wasn't quite so helpful. And then a rather larger idea I have about um, what could happen going forward. So, oh, hang on a second. I have a slight problem with my... Um, so this is a book that I picked off a shelf um, when I was at work this weekend. It was lovely being back in the library. And there's, I've just cut and I've done a screenshot of the relevant page um, in the database. So um, John Priddo, um, so it turns out Lincoln has two books owned by him and there are a couple of others scattered around Oxford libraries. So this is a really great example of how I think for somebody who does my job, this is a fantastic resource. Um, I, I could have, you know, Wikipedia is a fantastic thing. I have access to the DNB. I could have found things out, but what this does is it gives me um, some biographical information. Um, but more than that, what I want to know is what this book is doing at Lincoln. And this gives me the tools to start answering that question. So when did it leave Prido's library? Um, and then I can start, it's in a 17th century binding. I think we can probably tell that from the picture. Um, and how did it end up um, at Lincoln? And where are other of his books in Oxford? So that for me, the database provided a quick answer to those questions and a sense of the context of this particular book that I think I wouldn't have got anywhere else. And for somebody who does the job that I do, which is to look at the ways in which the individual book form part of the history of the college library, um, that's invaluable. Uh, another example of that is um, uh, I have chatted to other people who do my job and Sophie Float, who is a cataloger who works at Balliol among other colleges, had a similarly positive experience last week with Thomas Wendy, um, unable to find anything about him. He's a major donor, I think, and I can't find the number. Um, Sophie can correct me, 2,000 books given to Balliol. Um, and um, she found, I think, biographical information and then um, other um, resources that she could go to, an essay that she could read, various things to provide the information that she didn't, wasn't able to find anywhere else. So. For somebody with the book in the hand, the name on the title page, this is all really invaluable and I think adds a huge amount to our understanding of the books that we're cataloguing. Um, I'm now moving quickly on to the cases where the database is a little less helpful. So um, I don't know if you can say, but I can't even see my own notes because I've got the photos tiled over my um, caption. So it's a this is a collection of 10 pamphlets dated between 1595, I think, and 1617. And I think fairly obviously what I'm looking at is Elizabeth Gore's name to this book. So I'm thinking if Elizabeth Gore wrote her name in this book and one of the pamphlets is dated 1617, that she probably is a 17th century book owner, or at least this book was in a library, a room somewhere in her house and she was able to write her name in it. Now, Elizabeth Gore doesn't figure in the database. I'm looking at David's face because David <laughs> will say, no, no, she does. She does. You just didn't find her. Um, so my first question is this. Um, I come across in my cataloging an awful lot of names that are simply names. That, I mean, I, I hazard a guess that they're 17th century or earlier or later by the handwriting, but that's a bit of a blunt tool in my hands, at least. And um, I would like to be able to put this name somewhere in the hope that if someone else came across this name in a hand that was similar or in with a, an inscription sort of phrased in a similar way, that the two examples could be brought together. So I don't think, I mean, does she merit an entry? I mean, of course she does, but there's not very much to put in it. Um, so my first suggestion is 
could the database perhaps host an informal list where people could maybe just put names that they come across and images of how those names appear. Um, so the process of matching might generate more information about them. Um, my second image is this. Um, so another book from Lincoln College, um, not one, I, I have to be honest, that I came across at the weekend as I catalogued this book years ago. So I know that the database doesn't function as a um, provenance handbook and that with things like this cipher, it's always going to be difficult to find out if you don't have any other evidence to find out whose it is. Now I know who this book belongs to because there's some other evidence that I didn't include in this photograph in the book. Um, I'm very interested in this book owner and I'd like to be able to find other books in his library. But because if I had come across this without the inscription, I wouldn't have known who it was. I'm sure that there are copies of books with that and people also people won't be able to identify it. Um, I'm now going to, there we go, identify it for you. Edward Nicholas, Secretary of State to Charles I and Charles II. And the reason I know that, I mean, one of the reasons is that there's an inscription. Um, William Boswell gave the book to him and um, uh, Nicholas is dated that 1650 in his own hand. So is it possible, again, in an informal way to have a part of the database where people, where somebody can make a sort of informed judgment about um, owners' inscriptions, ink stamps, ciphers that are always going to be hard to decipher? Because something, someone like John Prido, that was very easy. This is not so easy. And I think that um, it would be helpful if there was if there were a few more aids to identifying some things that are very challenging. And clearly that list could be endless. Um, but you know, if we could start with this, that would be great. Um, and then um, again, build up collaboratively a list of books that have this ink stamp in them, or, or you know, or one of the many other um, ciphers or ink stamps or dare I say book plates that people struggle to identify. So I have a more general point, um, which is that the, of the questions that are posed on the, at, on the landing page, how many books did this person own? I've only got a little bit of time left. What kind and what happened to them? Those are the questions that really interest me. And they're questions that are frustrating. It's hard to get an answer because library catalogs are so difficult to navigate. Um, and I know that the database does share a few examples of books that have been found in libraries. Some of those, actually, I looked at some of them today. Some of them haven't yet been catalogued, some of the Oxford ones. Um, so even with the shelf mark, it, there often isn't a catalog record to accompany the shelf mark. Um, now, I know it would be a huge job to link the database to library catalogues, and I have no idea how that could be done. Speaking as someone who works on her own in two libraries, I would love a larger platform for some of the work that I do. Having catalogued a book with a 17th century book owner, I would love the opportunity to be able to just put a permanent link to that record somewhere on the database so that that would be accessible to people. Because my concern with my cataloging um, is that you hit save and then the rest of the record disappears into the online catalog and will never be retrieved again. So the opportunity to actually put these out there in a way, you know, to say, here's, here's another copy of a book owned by Prido or um, Elizabeth Gore or whatever. So that's my larger question. Is it possible? I think people who do the job that I do, people who catalog early printed books want to collaborate, they want to share what they know, and they often would like a different kind of platform to be able to um, sort of promote the work, we're not, that sounds very self-serving, yeah, but just somewhere else to make these books accessible and public. And is that something that could possibly happen with this database? Right, um, I'm now passing back to David. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> Hello, is everybody, am I? Am I back? I'm. I'm still seeing Sarah kind of centre stage on my screen. Is, am I, am I talking to the world? Yeah. 
Right, jolly good. In which case, um, uh, I'd like to say thank you very much to my co-presenters. Um, and I hope that, that with that, uh, um, you know, you've got enough of a, a flavour of this database and what it is and how it works, um, at, you know, at least to be able to go away um, and play with it more yourselves, which I would hope um, people might, might like to do. One of the questions that came up uh, in a presentation um, about this database that we did last year, somebody said, why, why did you create it? Uh, to which my answer is, um, because I, I think it ought to exist. I th I mean, I've long thought that there is a bit of a gap in our kind of reference infrastructure in book history around book ownership, book provenance, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, um, you know, if we can make something that's useful and workable, then uh, you know, we need to fill that gap. There are numerous online resources out there that have a lot of information about provenance in them, but they start from books and particular libraries uh, on the whole, rather than the philosophy of book owners online, which is, you know, let's start with owners, let's create a spine of owners and work from that, and that is its philosophy. And But I mean, there are other projects out there which are obviously relevant, um, and we're trying to create something that that complements and 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 fits the gap that is there, rather than kind of replicate stuff that's that's already there. Um, what can you do with this database? I think I hope uh, we've had some questions, uh, some answers to that question um, already. I mean, I hope that it can help people who are uh, cataloging and working with early books like Sarah, um, and I hope it can similarly help people who are collectors, dealers, auctioneers. Uh, I mean, that whole kind of world of people working with early books, I would hope, could find this um, useful too. Um, I think it can also work in a more uh, sort of academic overview research project kind of sense. Um, some of those questions that are up at the beginning of it, um, you know, are around, um, you know, what do we know about libraries in the round? How can we contextualize and better understand any particular library or book owner within that broader contemporary context? Um, so I think there, there's work that can be done there. The, my uh, shameless plug here, my book um, that's just been published by Oxford University Press, which is based on my, my lectures on this topic, um, is an attempt to use the data in this database in that kind of way and present something which is more of a rounded overview of the subject as a whole. But I think there are no end of PhD projects which can be picked up and done from individual entries in this database. The, you know, the idea is that you can come at it from a variety of angles. Um, what, it, what it never intended to be was a list of every name that appears inscribed in every book which is out there on our shelves, because I think that would be, um, that would be impossibly large. But I think Sarah's point about having some kind of uh, informal area, some kind of scratch pad, something where, where ideas can, where information can be clocked up, I think we should, we should go away and think about that a bit more. But I mean, one of the key aims of this session in my mind is to, to ask you to invite the community, the, um, uh, all you people who are very kindly signed up to, uh, to attend this session tonight, um, to look for advice, steers, um, ideas on where should we go from here. Um, the database is not perfect even within its own parameters, it is a very far from perfect animal. Um, and there are many ways in which it could be made better uh, by having more and better data in it. And clearly, uh, I think it would be more useful to more people if it was expanded both chronologically and geographically. Um, and when we first launched it, one of the points that was made was, well, you know, English, um, you know, isn't that just a little bit too xenophobic? To which the answer is yes, of course it is, and it does need to be expanded, but we do have limited resources. And this thing is currently created um, 
with very modest funding provided by the Bibliographical Society and some others to get us to where we've got to so far, uh, but we don't have limitless resources. So I think one of the questions is, um, you know, where can we best concentrate our efforts going forward in order to make it more useful for more people? Because that is really important, you know, the usefulness to more people. If this database has a purpose and a future, I think it is by becoming embedded as a community resource for people who work uh, in book historical fields from, from many directions. Um, and that is what will, uh, that was what will help to build it, um, engagement with it and developing it in a way that makes it useful uh, is what we need. So we you know we would we would very much welcome steer advice um, from all you good folks on where we should best concentrate our efforts. We are thinking um, about places where we might go to look for further funding. We are thinking about opportunities for uh, for 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 bigger funding bids than what we've had so far. Um, and you know how to how to hone that uh, to have the best chance of success is one of the things that we need to think about um, and and on that point of engagement and wider community engagement uh, that again is one of my one of my appeals uh, to you this evening whatever the future of this database is if it has a future and it goes on being developed then I think an element of wider community engagement of crowdsourcing, whatever you want to call it, is surely part of that future. Um, the database has got um, built into it uh, feedback pages uh, where anybody can ask a question or can um, fill in, you know, can provide some data uh, to suggest augmentations to the database. Um, we have a few uh, volunteer editors who have kindly signed up, David Shaw being one of them since the project launched, to say, um, well, yes, I, um, I, I'd be game to help. Um, I can find some time to create some entries for you. And I think whether, whether you can create 10 entries or 100 entries, uh, if you would be interested, then we'd be very interested to hear from you. Um, uh, it's not quite as simple as just typing up a word file because it is, it does need semantic media wiki markup, but we've got manuals to, uh, to show you how to do that. Um, so we are, we, you know, we are interested in appealing for um, people who might be interested in helping because there is a huge amount of knowledge out there in the community, the community who are tuned in tonight. So many, so many of you know so much more about certainly particular entries within that database um, than those of us who, who built it have done. And if you can be encouraged, enthused to, to feed that in, it'll make it a more useful resource for the community at large. So that's, that's where we're at. Um, those are our key questions. Um, what we'd really like to do is use the rest of the time that's available to uh, encourage some discussion. Um, uh, so do please um, ask your questions and make your suggestions. And I think you can do that either by um, uh, waving your hand on the screen and Karen will pick you up and you can ask a question um, or um, uh, put a question into the chat uh, and Karen will, um, will metro D it or whatever the right phrase is um, and, um, uh, and read out questions and we will try and answer them and I will try to farm them out as best I can um, so that it's not just me responding to them um, but um, yeah I hope that makes sense that's what it is um, over to over to you the audience